for the last few weeks, I have been trying to instruct on the subject of giving. Last week, I tried to illustrate there must be a point of departure. If, as an under-shepherd, I'm even remotely concerned, and I say that to be ridiculous, if I'm remotely concerned about your eternal destiny, I will teach you these principles until, in a positive, not a negative sense, but in a positive sense, like Moses seeing the golden calf, grinding it up and making them have gold dust soup, you will be eating and drinking these concepts because they are integral, not just to the Christian walk, but they are integral to your eternal destiny, what you will do in eternity. There's so much to say regarding stewardship. In fact, I, I almost I had a big dilemma. Which, which way do I go? Because there's so many things I need to say. And seemingly my frustration is that Sunday is just simply not enough to say it. My fear is that I'm going to run out. Of t- it's like too many messages, too little time. I'll run out of time before I can say everything I want to say. So, I'm actually going to pick up on the heels of a concept from last week, but take you somewhere else. Now, last week I gave you the picture. We're not going to 2 Corinthians. I gave you the picture of two different personalities, Zacchaeus and his response to Christ and the rich young ruler and his response to Christ. Now, you're going to find these are reoccurring themes. You cannot escape them. There is no middle ground in Christianity. There are some people that think that they can coast through their life somewhere in the laissez-faire middle ground. It's, it's all good. It's not all good. And when you begin to really understand what God desires of you, you either become proactive, delighting to do His will, or you are repulsed and eventually banished into eternal damnation. There is no middle ground, friends. Anyone who tells you that there's some resting place is a fool. You're either faithing, our King James always translates to believe, believing, but from the Greek we know the word pistis. You are either acting in pistis, in faith, going forward, or you're acting in apistis, going in reverse, throwing the forwardness into reverse, and there is no neutral ground. So with all of these illustrations that I have given you, I've mentioned many times the attitude that permeates the church world, the world to the church world, the Judas syndrome, why this waste, or the woman with the alabaster box. There's nothing in between. Now, today you may be at a crossroads. Some of you listening to me may be at a crossroads where you have been vacillating long enough. And out of the words of the prophet in the Old Testament, he said, if God be God, worship him. And if Baal is is your God, worship Baal. But you must choose between these two at some point. Who is your master? And if you have a master, you are therefore a servant. Now, these are harsh concepts for people to hear. We no longer say words like servant, which truly rightly translated is slave from the Greek, doulos. To say that word brings extreme irritation and displeasure because we know those words are associated with very poor, bad things that have happened even in our time. But in God's economy, That word was never pejorative. In fact, the more you understand your slave servitude role to Christ, the more you will understand you were never free until you belonged to Christ. You were never free people until you belonged to Him. And once belonging to Him, because you're not your own, you're you're bought with a price, once you belong to Him, you begin to understand what true freedom is. You see, the world has it backwards. They think you come into the church, 
and you lose all your freedom. Satan has won this great victory in convincing the minds of those that you'll never be free if you come to serve Christ. But the fact of the matter is this is why Paul said, I bear in my body the marks, the stigmata of the Lord Jesus Christ as a brand in his being that said ownership. And between you and me, a thinking person would look at the Apostle Paul and say, surely this man could have gone out and made great fortunes in his uh, business. Surely this man could have done many other things, but when he became what he was destined to be in Christ, he became more free than he could ever be while he was zealously serving in the wrong direction. So, I'm going to teach a lesson today, and whether you have heard this lesson before or not, I don't care. Glad you applauded for that. Now, I'm going to take you back into Luke 19. And just to recap, because I just I juxtapose something that's cru really quite crucial to today's message. We have the um, rich young ruler coming to Christ in chapter 18 asking how to, or what he should do to inherit eternal life. And I juxtapose that with the conversion of Zacchaeus in chapter 19. And right there between these two concepts is nestled in Jesus foretelling how he must die and on the third day raise again. And it's, it's, it's staggering because it, it says, I'm reading in chapter 18, verse 34, and they understood none of these things when he spoke about his death how he should die, and what manner of his death, and that he should raise up again on the third day, they did not understand. Now, it says these sayings were hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. So between these two pictures, one of the rich young ruler and one of Zacchaeus, right in the middle there's a mention of the resurrection. Now, I'm telling you this as an aside, no mere mortal man in each of these cases and through and through the book could have just sat down to write a letter. There are great things in here of interest, and then there's this bird's eye view. We can see that between the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus, we have mention of the resurrection. And this greatly affects our understanding of what is going to come right after the mention of Zacchaeus's conversion. So we remember that Zacchaeus climbs up in the tree. Jesus says to him, make haste, come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And of course, we know he made haste, came down, received him joyfully. And we don't know what happened in that house, by the way, but we certainly know this, that afterwards, when Zacchaeus comes out, he said unto the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham, child of faith. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, I want you to pay careful attention to this. I've just finished recapping what happens with Zacchaeus. But there was no chapter and verse so read on with me. And as they heard these things, what things? Well, the very things that occur in what I just read to you. He added and spake a parable. So don't read these things independently. We can study passages, but you must read the sum and see after the event of Zacchaeus. As they heard these things, what things? This day is salvation come? No, first... As they heard these things, Zacchaeus saying that he would make restitution, which is proof of his, essentially his right attitude, his point of departure, his, his metanoia, his change of mind. And then Jesus' words, this day is salvation come to this house for as much as he also is a son of Abraham, child of faith. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. As they heard these things, he added 
and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem, because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Again, it, it's staggering to think that people followed him around, they heard what he said, but they did not hear, they could not understand. We read these things sometimes and we think, well, what, what were they, stupid? But that's the way we come into the church as well. We hear and initially we can't understand. And we can't understand until God brings the illumination to our soul. This is why I keep repeating about the parable of the sower. I don't have the capacity. I wish I did. I'd be lying to you if I said otherwise. I don't have the capacity to save somebody. Well, there are many people I, I think along the way I've wasted my time, perhaps God only knows. In eternity, it will only, it'll only be known. But I can't save you. God, through his word, through his spirit, can. And if you're one of those that's able to hear and receive with the desire that maybe you don't understand the full fulcrum of things, but you, you keep coming back, that it might become clear to you eventually that this Christianity that we profess so boldly is much more than what most of Christendom has painted it to be, a rich, bold life full of the hope of glory living in you. And this parable really does help me to understand certain things that I think we, we would do well to revisit. He said, therefore... A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Now, there are days when I wish so, so much work to correct some of the things that are in the King James. Um, let's see if we can find from my contemporary parallel New Testament those eight translations, or yes, eight translations. Um, there are some different ideas here. A very important man went to a far country to be made a king and then to return home. Um, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. The principle's there. The problem is that we read so quickly over this that we might not see something very clear. A certain nobleman is, in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ. And... When it says he went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return, it's very clear that he would return as king, king of king, lord of lords. Now, this is a pivotal understanding. This is a pivotal part of understanding for missing this 12th verse in its full force. We know no man knoweth the hour of his return, not even the angels in heaven. But he speaks here of something that will help us to better identify what our responsibility is. And before I pass this by, because there's so much in here, do you realize Jesus calls himself a certain nobleman? Through the gospel records, he was rejected and refused. He came to his own, and his own received him not. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat that again. But more importantly, there were certain people who did understand his nobility from the beginning. In this particular season where people are celebrating Christmas, if you go into any store that sells greeting cards, look for the one that has the three wise men on it. And then, I'm saying this as a sidebar which has nothing to do with my message. There were, there were much more than three wise men. People are awfully confused about what they read and what they believe. There were three gifts offered by these, if you want to call them wise men or learned men, who understood a king indeed was born, and he wasn't born December 25th either. Okay, for those of you that are just tuning in, <laughs> And you're going, whoa! <laughs> this is just for the new people. I give you new people a challenge. Find his birth month in the New Testament. Find the word Christmas in the New Testament. Because a lot of people come, and you've all been taught. Most of you have been taught. But you know how many people come, and they say, no, 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 of course it's in the Bible. Okay, chapter and verse, please. 
And because there is little teaching on this, because most of the church world says, oh, listen, we're not going to try and educate people on this subject. We don't want to ruin a good thing. I could really ruin it right now, by the way. <laughs> oh, can I ruin it? Yes. Wait, wait a minute. Wait. So even if one cannot wrap the mind around the fact that Christ wasn't born December 25th and I cut you some, some slack because you haven't done your investigating, here's the great anomaly. If you're going to celebrate Christmas, I'm going to leave that one alone for a minute, but if you're going to celebrate that, what was the event marking the a little period after Jesus' birth where we have these depictions of the Christ child in the manger but it, were, it was these men coming from afar to give gifts to the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't travel all the way following a star to get to a, direct, to a place and then say, hey, I think we should exchange gifts here. What do you think? <laughs> Good idea. See, you can go to the root of many things. I'm not against gift giving. I think that if people understand it's a good time to begin understanding about giving not because we give gifts to each other because of the commercialization of, of what people have made things. But rather, I, I'd be supportive of that if people said, the first thing I'm going to do in this season, even though I don't understand a thing about what she just said, is I'm going to bring a gift to the Lord. Then you might have my attention. We might have something to discuss. I can turn anything into a giving message. <laughs> so... I'm sorry, I just had to get, just put that sidebar in there that there were certain people that recognized his nobility and actually responded to it by bringing gifts. Let's let that settle for a little while. Now, back to the message here. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. He called his ten servants, and I want you to really read carefully because you've probably done like me and not read this aright many times. Ten servants delivered them ten pounds and said, Occupy till I come. Now, please write in the margin of your Bible because this becomes important. That word occupy really, it's a, it's a decent word, but it's, it's, it really doesn't capture the essence of the Greek. The Greek word there is where we get our English word for pragmatize. Pragmatize until I come. And I might say, well, what, what difference does that make? Well, if you were to look up the word pragmatize in the dictionary, you would find first to consider, then to represent, then to embody, and then to materialize. So what I'm saying to you is occupy just sounds like, here's, here, here. Okay, stay right there, I'll be back. That's what occupy sounds like to me that could carry a slide of meaning. But here we have some action words. We have to consider, that is thought, to represent, that is to carry through a concept, to embody, that is the living realm of something, and to materialize, to make come to be what perhaps was not yet. But his citizens, these are different people now, ten servants, ten slaves, ten doulos. The Greek reads that way. But his citizens, different folks here, hated him, sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Now what I find extremely interesting in this depiction is we have three sets of lessons. We have varieties of reward, apportioned to different degrees of zeal and industry and the master service. We've got the eternity of loss and shame, which will be the portion of the unfruitful servant, and we've got the fate of the enemies. So I'm going to go back to where I started. There's only really two camps of people. You are either for or against. You are either gathering or scattering. There's no middle ground. Jesus does, there, there's never been a place except for his comment in Revelation regarding the people being lukewarm. There's never been a place where he's given middle ground. Once you understand that, you're, you're on a good point of departure. So, his citizens hated him, 
sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, and there is your, your picture and type of the first verse, he came back being the rightful sovereign of his kingdom. Then he commanded these servants, these slaves, to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man gained by trading. Now let me stop right there because if you are a person who reads commentaries, you may say you have read something that suggests that this is a parallel, the nobleman going into a far country and so forth, a parallel of Herod's son, which many have speculated. Uh, I, my last act in presenting a message to you is to know what everybody has said on the matter. Not my first, but my last act. And Josephus chronicles the life of the son of Herod. Do you remember Herod issued the, the decree at the time of the birth of the Christ child that all male children should be killed. And then after his death, his son takes the throne, usurps it essentially, which it was not his right to. And in doing so, I'm just giving you the, the large picture rather than reading this to you. Son usurps the throne, recognizes he does not have the right to rule. He must go to a far country, being Rome, to appeal to Caesar, for Caesar to make him proper king in that land. He, in fact, is not given the role of king, but of ethnarch. That's even a little step down from tetrarch. He's ethnarch. And in 6 AD, he's just, they remove him because he was just terrible. But in his journey to Rome to petition Caesar, a whole embassy of people went after him, pleading to Caesar, please do not make this man rule over us. We don't want him and his tyrannical rule. Now, people, many commentators say, you can read this and see the parallel. If you read commentaries, I'm mentioning this to you in passing because I think it's a far stretch. It may be so. But if the nobleman that went to a far country to receive a kingdom for himself and to come back king, the difference is that Jesus Christ came back king of kings, eternal, reigning supreme, never removed, versus an earthly king who came back for just a time, not reigning over everything, and was shortly after removed. So I say that in passing for you people who like to read commentaries obsessively. I will pray for you. <laughs> and it came to pass when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money. And that word right there, if you have a Bible like mine, has a little one beside it, and if you go to the margin, it says silver. Now, I want to be clear about something. He gave them responsibility. This is called the parable of the pounds. Gave them responsibility over tangible, over things tangible. But I, I must make something clear because I'm convinced of this. In your margin, it will read silver, and that was the unit of exchange in that day, or how you would get by in buying and doing. But I wish to point out one thing, because this picture of the money, which is indeed real money, silver, also paints a picture, silver being the color of redemption. And I want you to hold that thought as well as the fact that there are ten servants, ten being the number of human responsibility in the book. Now, he calls and he says to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. This word trading is the same word as the word, it's got a prefix on it, but the word for pragmatize. Now, in the first sense, occupy till I come, pragmatize till I come. I want you to take note of these things because for people who are interested, this matters. Occupy till I come, pragmatize till I come is an imperative verb in the Greek. He's not saying, hey, if you feel like it or if you decide to. He's saying, this do. And it's in the middle voice. Pragmatize for yourself. 
I am not going to pragmatize for you. And down here, by trading, is another verb in the middle voice as well. How much did they gain by what they did? Now, notice there were ten servants, ten slaves, ten pounds. The first came saying, Lord, please circle this word. It's probably the most important one in this whole passage. Thy. Thy. Thy pound. Whose is it? Thy. These are the lessons that if people would just take the time to read it aright, you begin to understand the message in here is much more profound than just some, you know, have some parable where people say, oh, you know, a parable is a, it's a good way to deduce doctrine. No, friends. It illustrates facets of doctrine. It gives the illustration of point and purpose. You know, we love to read about the prodigal son. We read all of that and hey, I know what to do if I find myself in a bad place, backsliding and far from God. Well, I want you to make the same application you'd make there in that parable to this one here. Thy pound hath gained ten pounds. I'd also have you note when Jesus said, you pragmatize, you occupy. I'm going to go back to the King James word. He didn't say how. He didn't say how long he would be gone. He didn't say how to do it. You know, in the church world, we're famous now for people writing books about how to, how to do everything for God. He didn't give a method of how to. He didn't say at a certain time, servant number one, you will write a book. You're best dying on Friday, daily. I'm sorry, I just, can't, I just can't give that up. It's just too delicious. Just keeping it real. Thy pound. He didn't say how he did it. He didn't say how to do it. You see, in this parable I also see we are not under the law. We're under grace. And... If we're under the law, he'd say, now do this and do it like this, and this is the way to perform the doing of it, and these are the methods. But under grace, where the Spirit is, there is liberty. He said unto him, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful, this is the other part, in a very little. You notice he calls the money, the pound that he gave, very little. And you know why it's represented like that? I love the fact that the Lord used a small portion. Well, this pound might be representative of three months' wages in, their, in this time, in, in their time. Still small. Because he knows we are not able, even when we're really good stewards, we're not able to handle the much. You know, he gives us the very little most of the time, it's a test. My fear is that most of us are not looking at it like that. We're not seeing that there's a test. We, we are being tried. This may shock some by God. What will you do with what you have? And the reason why I mention the fact that money is also silver, picturing the color of redemption, is because the first place you must start your stewardship is in understanding who you are and how you got there. Your salvation. Go back to point of departure. You have that as a starting point. Everything else lines up perfectly. Now notice the difference between the first one that came. And he says, you've been faithful in very little. He didn't say you've been faithful in a lot. You've been faithful in very little. Why? Because one pound... One pound, Lord, one of your pounds gained ten. Because you've been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. Now notice the difference between the first servant or slave and the second one. Because here he doesn't say, you've done good and you've been faithful. He says to him, 
Be thou also over five cities. I want you to notice the difference. We went from great zeal. We don't know how. The man turned one into ten. Great zeal, great desire, great faith, great expectancy of the Lord's return to get an accounting. This is why it's imperative that people wake up to the point, I can talk to you about grace all day long, but if I'm not also telling you about the judgment seat of Christ, where we shall all stand and give account, which ties in very clearly to this. No good, faithful, in very little, just he says, likewise, be thou of five cities. And then came another one, saying, Lord, behold, here's thy pound. I put it in a napkin. I kept it in a napkin for you. Now, I want you to get the picture of this because it's so subtle and because we're so familiar, we might just go right by it. You see, I really believe that most of the people that I will come encounter with and communication with, they are napkin people. They don't understand. This picture right here is so very moving because in trusting these servants with very little, here's a little for you, and here's a little for you. And in doing this here, this is for you, and you hold on to this, and you pragmatize it. You, you make it materialize. You do something with it. It's not only the doing. There is a reward at the end of the doing for the ones that were full of zeal and faith. And I speak not of doing good works to get out and do something, but rather pay attention to what's there, and you see there's a twofold. It's an anticipation, preparation for future service and anticipation of future honor, not just an exercise in futility. So when, when I talk to you about giving and stewardship and your responsibility, I'd, I'd love for you to go back and read this because it puts in clear perspective what you were given to be steward over and how you managed and begin first, as I mentioned. Jesus starts with ten servants, and I love that number, human responsibility, regarding, and I'm using this very in a very broad way, beginning with the silver money exchange, but begin with it as the picture of your redemption, and then go to money. And see, if you're not looking at giving in a different way, perhaps this was a great test. Perhaps there was an expectancy on the part of the Lord. Returning as king, he would understand who would be faithful enough to serve with him in his kingdom. See, when we read things like lay up treasures in heaven and people are, whoa, I couldn't possibly do something like that because I'm in the here and now. Attach these things that Christ spoke about regarding eternity, and you'll find right here in this parable something quite shocking, which is what you do down here, your time, your whole entire being, how you move and have your being. I believe when you do give account, you know, people say, well, you know, you're going to go down this pathway? Yeah, it will be seen very much like a test that you didn't know was happening. Now, this should wake some people up and jar some into a mode that says, well, I've been slacking all this time. I've been wasting all this time. I've been silly. I didn't, you know, I didn't think there was going to be a test on this subject. <laughs> you ever do that? Take a class somewhere? Never be a test on this. Then the teacher comes out and gives you a test. And, wow, gee, I didn't think there was going to be a test on this. Are you kidding? Nope. So... Now listen to this man here. Put it in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. I want to read out of the 26 translations, because it says here, you are such a hard man, you are such a stern man, severe, harsh, and tight-fisted. It's a nice way to talk to God, isn't it? <laughs> thou takest up, that thou layest not down. No recognition. I want you to see this. No recognition 
that what was given to him in the pound was given to him by God. No recognition whatsoever. He says, you take that which you laid not down and you reap that that you didn't sow. And he said to him, your own mouth condemns you. He's called a wicked servant. I want you to see in the church, because I said there's only two camps of people. There are only the enemies and the servants. But within the servants, there may be degrees of servitude. See, there are people in the church today that are just going through the motions. They have no relationship to Christ. They have no desire to get to know him through his word. When Jesus said, I've repeated this for weeks now, Jesus said in John 17, this is life eternal that they may know thee, the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he hath sent. And how do you get to know even a person? You spend time with them. You spend time in the word. This is why I can't stand these places where no word is taught, just entertainment. And people say, well, boy, I really felt good today when I went to church. Well, your feeling good is probably going to take you to hell in a handbasket if when you get to the door of heaven thinking that you have some special privilege because you sat in a church somewhere and never so much as cared to know who your master will be in eternity, don't expect the door to open wide for you, friend. Don't. It's a hard thing, but if you really think you're a servant or slave of God, your attitude will be one that says, like in the Old Testament, I love my master. I don't want to leave him. And in the Old Testament, the ear was nailed to the doorpost. Now Jesus is the door, and our ear is the method of hearing and obedience. You'll say, I love my master. I delight to do his will, not because I'm forced to in some Uh, demand and decree, but because I love my master and I want to please him. But listen to this. He's called a wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, that I was a harsh man, that I was a hard man. Taking up that I laid not down and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. Now, You can go right by this. And again, I said, this is a chock full of instruction for the church. Into the bank. Which bank? Which bank? Thank you. Somebody got it right back there. It's certainly not the Bank of America. (laughs) Wherefore, then gavest not thou my money into the bank? You see, he says it's, it's his money belongs to him, into the bank. What does he say in Matthew 6? Lay up treasures in heaven. Now, people get very, it's amazing, when you start talking about this, people immediately, they go a little nutty on this subject. You mean you give to the church? Well, not here. You don't do that here. You're paying the teacher. The church is a building. I don't know if, if I wasn't here, and there wasn't a teacher here, I don't know what the concrete cement walls could teach you. I just don't. But there is a response that should be there. It should be even Jesus giving this response. My money into the bank that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. His money. Now, Let's get this straight. I'm bought with a price. I'm going back to that silver for a minute. I'm bought with a price. I say I belong to him. And yet in the things that I say I belong to him, I don't even carry out an action in my life and living that I belong to him because I put it in a napkin and hid it. Now, let's take this illustration to a bigger plateau because it's not limited to giving. It is stewardship on a much larger scale. And have you know, there were ten servants. Only three came forward. Only three that we know about. Giving us a picture of what is inside the church, much like the parable of the sower, telling us the different types of people 
and the way they might receive or not receive the Word of God. Here we have three different types of people in the church. We have those people that are so gripped by faith. They live by faith. They understand what they're hearing, and they are zealous to, if you want to call it industry, perform, to please the Master, expecting His return and expecting, anticipating what will happen for greater privilege and rewards at a future time. Then we've got that second class of people. They're the ones that they kind of remind me of some of those people that you meet in a classroom. They never study. They're just kind of average students, a C student. They never open the books. They just manage to get a C and pass the class, never really doing too much more than they have to do. And the last one here with the rotten attitude, not thinking he has a responsibility. Now, I don't know where the other seven are. It doesn't say where the other seven are. This could become a mind game. It doesn't say where the other seven went, like that dollar. Do you know how tormented I was with that <laughs> for years? I would have to listen to that at 2 o'clock in the morning. And it always changed, the joke always changed a little bit. For you that don't know, Dr. Scott used to tell a joke about a dollar. Where'd the other dollar go? He said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. Here's the fairness syndrome of the world that always creeps in. But he's got already. In fact, slight, slight Judas syndrome. Why this waste? Why give it to him? You can give it to somebody that doesn't have any. For I send you that, that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he, that he hath shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, Bring them hither and slay them before me. Now, you might say, gentle Jesus said that. I just thought I'd make sure to read this properly because he says about his enemies, slaughter them in my presence, slay them outright before me, execute them before my eyes. Gentle Jesus? You mean the warm and fuzzy Jesus who cuddles everybody said that? Oh, I've got it somewhere else because it's, it's worth reading somewhere else. In the NIV, it says, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Slay them in my presence. Kill them while I watch. Now, you might say, well, I, I don't like the end of that parable. It's not really good. Now, I don't talk too much about heaven and hell. I tell you, I believe in life eternal. But here's a great picture for you of the ones that are not willing that Jesus should reign over them. And for the one who basically hid his pound in the napkin, somewhat interesting. There's no wailing and gnashing of teeth. There's no being cast out into utter darkness. We just read, it's just kind of the end. That should bring some real shockwaves into the church, not just in this church, but in any place where this message is heard. People hearing the gospel message and being complacent in that hearing, you will find yourself in this parable. And I'm sorry, you know, a lot of people like to talk about how their faith and they do absolutely nothing. I'll pray for you. I'm praying for your ministry. I'm praying for you. Well, I need your prayers. But more importantly, the whole person, the whole behavioral, attitudinal fix on what is going on here, pragmatizing till he comes. We do not know the day or the hour that he will return. We have an idea. We speculate of the season, the time of year that has just recently passed. But no one knows the date. That should be a fresh reminder, always looking for his return. That the first Christians did. Well, yeah, they sure wasted their time, didn't they? They were waiting, and he didn't show. And for 2,000 years, people have been waiting. Right, that's the whole point. That's the point of waiting with anticipation, living every single day as a steward, faithfully serving. And if you want to take this parable a little bit further, when Jesus says to the one that turned the one into the ten, 
He says he was faithful in very little. Do you know, we can have many things. We can amass many things, or we can have very little. But in the big scheme of things, whether you're Bill Gates rich or you're pauper poor, he's looking at those two things in the same realm, in the same dimension. He makes no distinction in the activity of the steward between the haves and the have-nots. I just want you to see the importance of this. You cannot escape the idea. We're not told to play with the pound. We're told to pragmatize it. And I want to repeat those words one more time, to consider what it is we are stewards of, to represent our stewardship, to embody, that is the life dedicated to Christ, and to materialize. There is the ability for the Christian to bring to pass certain things, beginning with the concept of giving. Now, I'd like to ask you a question, and it's rhetorical. Why would a church anywhere motivate the parishioners to give for some reason, a trinket, a bauble, emotive reasons, when the greatest is right here on these pages. You see, the little that that one was entrusted with was a test to see what he would do with that little, which was the preparation for a greater stewardship in eternity. If that's not motivation enough for you to get right on the giving track and do what you're supposed to do, you'll never be motivated. Not that I need to. It's Jesus' words giving the picture very clearly. And if we take the ratio that there are ten servants, we only have three that are stepping forward that we know of, for whatever the reason. I don't know where the other seven went, but just these three give us a picture of what's inside the church. And I'm asking you today to really consider what I'm saying, especially for those people that come into the church and they are so engrossed with what religious television has produced as an ideology concerning money. Do you know that most people, when you begin to talk about money and giving and stewardship, just absolutely cringe, oh, no, I can't listen to that. In fact, I'm sure there are people listening on the Internet that tuned the volume down or turned off and went away. I'll come back when she starts to talk about healing. I'll come back when she starts to talk about something that I really like. Give me a good promise, a good faith handle. Give me some good motivation that I can feel good today. Well, I'm giving you something to feel good over because if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you're going to recognize that maybe today is the day you need to change your focus. And instead of being the napkin person and thinking that it's okay, you can basically blow off everything and there's no no accountability and there's nothing on your back. I'm asking you to look here and see that the one that decided to do nothing with what he had, it doesn't say anything about Cities? Do you read anywhere that he was responsible over cities? Do you read anywhere that he got a reward? Do you read anything that the others got, even the one that was right in the middle? He just he said, okay, I have cities, yours. I'm asking you today to consider this. The hardest thing for people to understand is this gives you an idea of what you are to do in the now, and it gives you an idea that this is preparation for the future. Now, I guess the problem is that most people in most churches aren't preaching eternity. So if you don't believe in eternity, it doesn't matter. But I go back to the words of Christ over and over again. Listen, if Christ be not risen, our faith is in vain. Paul's saying this to the Corinthians. And the declaration of our faith is stupid. And there is no purpose for doing what we do. Or you actually believe that Jesus Christ was the first goer of something that had never been before intended from the beginning, but because of Adam, not possible. The first goer of many more to come, and we shall be joint heirs with him, ruling and reigning. And the last one of the last chapters of Revelation says, to him that overcomes, he shall inherit all things and be my son. Now, I'm asking you, if that's not a worthy reward at the end of the road and you're so impatient and so tethered to time that you think, I just can't give and I can't participate, 
then I have nothing to say to you. But if you understand what I've said, just like those churches in the book of Revelation, if you have an ear to hear what the Spirit of God through His Word is saying today, some of you better wake up. Times are clicking away, and I don't know what the time is. I act like today could be the last day, and I'm not going to have a do-over where I say, well, God, you know, I wasn't that good of a steward, so is there any possibility I could just go back for a little while and try it all over again? Because I know I'll do better the second time. This is it. This is your chance right here. This is your opportunity. And once you have exhausted your opportunity here, you don't get another one. Now you get many chances to start over, so maybe today is the day that you start over saying, I'm looking at this one that got the same equal pounds distributed, and I want to be like him. Well, then you better start by having the faith to understand Christianity is not some complacent occupy Occupy till I come. Yes, sir, I'll be right back. <laughs> Most of Christianity. Or so busy doing in the doing of other things that have no relevance to the building up of the body of Christ. Giving is one. Your, your testimony, when people talk about their testimony, your testimony is your life dedicated to Christ. Not what you were, but what you are in Him. We were all that, children of disobedience. Ephesians says we were all that. What's so special about one who was a junkie and one who was a hooker and one who was a uh, whatever? What's so special about that? The more special thing is what you are now, a new creature in Christ Jesus. And if you are that, you will have a desire to respond. That's my message. I want to say one last thing. Many churches I have been to and visited with, many, think the mark of spirituality is tongue-talking. The mark of spirituality is their performance in the church. Worship comes, and it's who can do the better crying jig, who can cry the most, who can be uh, outdoing somebody else. The mark of Christianity is Christ in you. And there is no greater giver. People like to quote John 3.16, God gave his only begotten son. He gave it for a purpose. If no one responded, by the way, to undo what Adam, first Adam, had done. If no one responded, but many respond. The question is, in that response, in the initial response, we have people then becoming misguided in what their worship ought to be. Jesus put a premium mark on the act of worship in giving. In your own time, we have a message we might play for you later about how Jesus puts the act of giving, fasting, and praying on the same spiritual plane. So while we have people professing to have these great marks of spirituality, the Lord Jesus Christ put that mark, putting the giving of money, fasting, and praying out of Matthew 6 on the same plane. You will never come closer to the heart of God than when you are in your mind understanding all you have belongs to him, you desire to give, and out of that desire comes, we'll call it the beginning of a stream that Jesus calls in the scriptures the river of life that never, never runs dry. Until that understanding comes, this is an, it's a, an effort in uh, just absolute idiocy. But for those people who really understand, lights come on, you say, wait a minute, everything I have God gave me. The test is my stewardship, how I manage these things. Go right down to where you live. Your children, I don't meddle in how you raise your children, but your children, you brought them a miracle, miracle of life. And then how you raise those children, that's a stewardship. Husbands and wives, that's a stewardship. There's so many of these that if everything is brought into the perspective, perspective of in Christ, you see your whole life as a testimony and stewardship before him, not just small segments of it. So I'm praying for those today that seemingly have a tough time with this. And as I said, I can't make you believe, I can't make you grab hold of, and I can't make you desire this word. But I'm certainly not going to use the tactics of the world to tell you what your responsibility is. Mine is to tell you we have this journey we're on in the now, headed towards a world without end, 
And everything we do here is preparation for that time. Everything. So take that to the bank of heaven with you. Now, ushers, please come. It's offering time. Uh, I'm going to be here next Sunday through the week, hopefully for festival. And I'm looking forward to seeing some of you who watched at home today who live close enough to be here. I'm looking forward to seeing some of you in the sanctuary with us next Sunday. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch Listen and learn 24 hours a day. Simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.